Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the I Six A Podcast. Yeah, we did it. Yes, sir. Dennis, how are you doing, man? I'm doing really good. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just excited just to be hanging out with you. This is just kind of my excuse just to come and just to hang out. Oh, really? Yeah, that's that's why I'm that's why I asked to be on this podcast. No, nah, man, you you came up to me and you're like, yo, or actually no, you texted me and you're like, yo, let's do this episode on Calvinism. And I'm like, every time you say something to me or you just come across <laughs> me, I just get really scared for no reason because you're my pastor. And then I realized, okay. As you should be. Yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. But then I'm like, okay, you know what? This is a good topic because the thing is, is like, for people my age, they don't really um, know how to explain their faith that well. Or maybe mm-hmm. some of them do, but they're not as, like, mature in, like, certain certain topics about Christianity. And they, they don't know how to, like, defend their faith or explain it in some ways. Okay. So th- I think that's why it's, like, important for us to meet up and kind of discuss this so we can kind of give out, like, some kind of clarification. And I, like, I can see that this in the future can, um, you know, be very useful for uh People my age. Mm-hmm. Actually, no, not even just for my age, just like people in general. Right. Just to have that information. About so, about uh about the, the doctrine of our of our salvation. Yeah, right? of course, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So jumping like right in, what specifically is Calvinism? There's like a lot of talk about tulip, Romans nine, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So kind of explain it. So Calvinism is just a a way to define what people believe about uh, how we get saved. Mm-hmm. So um, I'll just back it up a little, a step further than that. Um, soteriology is, um, it's the, the doctrine of our salvation. Okay. That's what soteriology is. And, um, and that's what Calvinism is a, um, it's one uh, view, one belief of of our faith and how we get saved and kind of to define how a person gets saved. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in Christianity, um, there is, there is, you know, a lot of different views. There's Arminianism, there's kind of the Catholic view, there's Calvinism. Uh, and it's important to remember that if we have the foundations correct, the, the same, mm-hmm. then, then we have the same faith. Our faith is not different, right? A Calvinist is no different from anybody else uh, in that we have the same faith because the foundations are the same. Yeah. We believe in Jesus. Uh, we believe that th- that our salvation is through the atonement, through His blood. We believe that there's only one way to God, and that is through Christ. Right? We believe in the same uh, core, the same foundations. Yeah. Um, but we differ in small things, and that's why we have uh, different understandings of salvation, like Calvin- Calvinism, yeah. for example. So Arminianism is more of like the opposite, and it's like free will. You know, yes, you yes. choose salvation by right. your, like by free will, and then Calvinism is more of like the, Calvinism on the is, other side. It's yes, like, yes. Uh, there's they're kind of opposite views, you could say, um, where <clears throat> Arminianism is more of, uh, and this is kind of more even the Catholic view is even more extreme than the Arminius view. Basically, it's you you choose God. Uh, God plays a smaller part. Our Calvinists believe that you play a huge part in, or sorry, God plays. The, the majority and actually yeah. does everything. Yeah. Um, and so they have this thing you mentioned, it's called the tulip, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, the five points of Calvinism. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, I'll just run through them real quick. Uh, it's an acronym f- and there's five points. Every, every uh, letter is a point. So the T stands for total depravity, which mm-hmm. means that a Christian or a person cannot choose God yep. because they're completely spiritually dead. Yep. without God. And I agree with that to a certain extent, right? That, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the U, uh, the second one in, in Tulip, the U is unconditional election. That means you didn't do anything. Uh, you're, you're chosen by God. You didn't do anything to deserve God's, God, how God chose you, which is also partially true, but they stretch it and they say, uh, you, you play no part in it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And so they, they stretch these views a little bit. The L is this one's kind of the most controversial because, and the least people agree with this one, is uh, the L is limited atonement. That means that Jesus Christ did not die for everybody. Yeah. He died for a few, a select few. The elect is what they yeah, like to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, they call yeah. it the elect. 
um, the I is the, um, let me see, the I is irresistible grace. That means that no matter what God is going to, if he chose you, that's it, you're his. You belong to him no matter what. Um, and this one I have a problem with because basically it means you cannot help but be drawn to God. Even if you don't want God, God's still going to have you. Yeah. Um, and then the P is, stands for perseverance of the saints, which basically means you're a Christian, you're going to stay a Christian, you're never going to lose your salvation, um, you will persevere. Or basically, God will persevere for you. So that's kind of just to sum up, and, and I think it's important to remember that not all Calvinists believe in all five points. Yeah, A lot of them are four-point Calvinists. Actually, uh, not all of them believe in the L. Uh, and then some of them are three-point Calvinists, some are two. And, and there are certain truths that I agree with, mm -hmm. uh, but not all of them. Um, and, and it's just, it's not necessarily, um, you know, a way to define every single Calvinist, but just a, a good kind of general overview of what, of what the Calvinist, Calvinism teaching is. Oh yeah. So. I, I think like, uh, I think when it comes down to our church specifically, and what, what mm -hmm. kind of like what we believe, I think it's, it's like, uh, taking a more balanced view. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. with Calvinism and Arminism, it's like it's like going to a different, like two different extremes. But I think what we were like talking about this before, it's like we have to like approach this from a more uh, balanced mindset. Because there are a lot of verses that talk about predestination mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. and where God is like is predestining predestining something, or there's like a kind of a context for a certain group of people right, that are pre right. predestined. And then there's like another uh, context where it's like God is talking, God allows free will. Mm -hmm. God is allowing people to choose him instead of their own selfish desires. Right, and right. it's like, a and for us, I think it's like this constant thing that we have to strive for every day. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say our church is, to answer your question, I would say it, it takes a more balanced view where, uh, and this is what I, I came to understand reading the Bible is that they're both true. Uh, the verses yeah. that say that God chooses us, and then there's verses that say that we that we choose God, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to understand that both are true. And I think it's a mistake when people debate and and argue about this and say, yeah. no, it's it, these verses are true and these ones don't don't look at these verses. I believe we have to look at both both sides equally. We have mm -hmm. to take both truths equally and say that yes, we are chosen by God. God has predestined us. Uh, the Bible says that, but the Bible also says that we have to choose God, mm -hmm. that we have to choose Him, and that uh, what we do matters, right? So, yeah. so I, I believe we have to look at both truths equally. And some people uh, will say, "Well, that how does that work? They contradict each other." I look at it as as this: uh, there are two truths that run parallel to each other, yeah, and they're both true. And how does it work? Uh, God predestines, but we, we also we have a free will. How does that work? You know, honestly, I don't really know. Yeah. And, and I think that's okay. This is a mystery of God. And to, for me to say, I have to be able to explain it. It, it, it doesn't really, um, it's kind of like saying a goldfish, you know, you look at a goldfish. Mm -hmm. Do you think a goldfish understands how we do math? No. Uh, do you think a goldfish understands how we do taxes, how we drive cars? No, it understands almost nothing. Same thing with God. Uh, same thing with us and God. Do we, do you think we can understand all of the mysteries of God? How He chooses us, but we also choose Him at the same time. Um, I actually remembered a a uh, saying by uh, Charles Spurgeon, who said, "When we get to heaven, on one side of the gates, it's going to say uh, whoever chooses, and on the other side of the gates, it's going to say." chosen before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. So I believe we'll see both truths in heaven. Um, so I, I, I decide to take a balanced approach to it. And honestly, this is, this is a topic that a lot of Christians debate about and they, uh, they get Very mad. Very concerned about, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think we always have to remember, as long as we have the same uh, foundations, mm -hmm. you know, that the only way is through Christ, uh, we we should not this isn't something that div, that should divide christians i have yeah. a lot of i know a lot of people i have friends that look at salvation through a calvinistic lens mm -hmm. and that's okay 
you know, we can agree to disagree on that. We're still brothers in Christ, right? We're still, we're not, you know, they're not a lesser Christian because they believe yeah. in, in Calvinism, but there are, I, w- I would say there are dangers in Calvinism that we need to avoid. Mm-hmm. And I, maybe we'll get to that later. Uh, but I think they're, they're both true. So, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So now that we, we've kind of gone over exactly what Calvinism is, what the five points are, and what our view or take on it mm-hmm. is, um, we have seven verses that we've picked, and we're just going to like go through them, kind of. Yeah, let's go through and them. And it's like, because it's, it's important that when we're talking about a topic like this, that we mm-hmm. use the Bible, that uh, that's like our foundation, because if, right, right. if we don't I have agree. the Bible as our foundation, then what's the point of even, you know, talking about a theological topic yeah. like Calvinism? Yeah. So the first one is, uh, <clears throat> here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we also live with this him. Is, sorry, this is Second Timothy. Yeah, second. So Second Timothy eleven through thirteen, chapter and, two, eleven through thirteen. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, NIV. <laughs> sorry, uh, Dennis is already um, grilling me right now. That's all good. Um, here's a tr- trustworthy saying: If we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, uh, we also reign with him. If we disown him, we also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot disown himself. Second Timothy two eleven through thirteen. Well, it says if we disown him, he will he will also disown us. I think you misread that, but that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a that's a really good verse. <laughs> you know, it basically says, hey, if 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 we don't remain faithful to God, then mm-hmm. God cannot remain faithful to us. If we don't, if we disown God, God will disown us. And I think that flies in the face of you know, Calvinism that says, uh, well, you can't, there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation, but it says here, if we are unfaithful to God, God will be unfaithful to us. I think this is pretty clear and pretty, uh, uh, this is a pretty strong verse to, to kind of oppose that, that understanding that you just, you can't, no, no, you can't do anything to, to lose your salvation. What do you, what do you think? I think like it's when I'm looking at this verse, it's saying like, it, it, when he's Paul's talking to the person, whoever it is, mm-hmm. you and me, he's basically saying like, you know, you have the choice. You know, if you choose, you can choose not to, you know, follow God. Basically, it's like if you disown Him, then He'll mm-hmm. disown you, kind of thing. And it's like you have a choice. It's not just like you're predestined, like God is is right, a, is right. destined you to to be saved. Yes. It's like you have to make that decision every day. Exactly. So that's kind of how I view that verse. That's a good one. Um, <clears throat> moving on, we're going to Revelation 3, 5. Um, oh, this is a good one right here. All right. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. So how would you explain this one? So it, it, it's, it's very interesting that it says that the one who is victorious, so Jesus is talking to the church and he said, whoever is victorious, I will not blot out their name mm-hmm. from the book of life. So that's referring, Jesus is saying that this person, he, his name is in the book of life and I'm not going to blot him, blot it out. Right. Yeah. So we could say, we can, we can look at that and say that could mean that if somebody is not victorious, mm-hmm. that their name could be written in the book of life and then blotted out yep. by Christ. So I think this is a strong warning to say that only the one who is victorious, all the one, only the one who remains faithful to Christ, believes in him and remains in him, mm-hmm. Will their name will not be blotted out from the book of life. And I always look at it like this. We receive our salvation by what? By faith, right? Yeah. By believing. Mm-hmm. So the only way we can lose our salvation is from a lack of that belief. Once we stop believing, we are no longer in right standing with Christ. We, we stop trusting in Him. Mm-hmm. That's when we lose our salvation is when we, when we stop putting our faith in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So maybe let's go to verse number three. Yeah, let's go to verse three. So this is Second Timothy two seventeen through eighteen. It says, "Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Gangrene. <laughs> gangrene. Uh, among them are Hymenaeus and 
Philetus. Philetus. <laughs> Philetus. Man, there's like this joke where like this guy is reading the Bible. He can't pronounce any of the names. Are you that like, guy? He's like, you know, we don't we don't ever pronounce it the right way. We just kind of mumble it in our heads. That's how I feel right now. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who departed from the truth? They saw. They say that the resurrection had already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. So. This is yeah. This is really this is a strong verse as well because it says that. These two guys, Hymenaeus and I guess I think you say Philetus? Philetus. 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 It says they've departed from the truth. So that means that they were in the truth and then they left the truth. Yeah. Right. So they they had the truth and then they departed from it. And then this is even a um, the next statement is even is even more um, gives us more understanding on this. It says that they they say that the resurrection has taken place. So they're false teaching false teachers, and it says they destroy the faith of some. So Mm -hmm. that means that people that had faith, their faith was destroyed by these two men and their teaching. So they had faith and their faith was destroyed. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty big statement that you can have faith and your faith can be destroyed. So it's not like once saved, forever saved. You once have faith and your faith will always be there, no matter what. No, it says these men, they had faith and it was destroyed. Yeah. These two guys, they had truth, but they departed from it. Yeah. So it's pretty clear here that it's saying that you can depart from the truth. Yeah, definitely. I think like we, we have also discussed this before, and it's like <clears throat> some Calvinists um, might say they like, oh, they, they were destined to fall or something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. That's like another alternative they would take. And it, you have to consider that, but it's I, also... I heard that, yeah. You also have to, you know... Uh, conclude that you're kind of adding something into the text. You, we were talking about this. It's like, mm-hmm. it's not really mentioned that they people are like predestined to fall, kind of like that type of thing. Yeah, it's like reading yeah. into the text. You're reading that, yeah. A, a lot of people will, would say, well, if they fell from the faith, that means that they were never in the faith. Or, or if they left the church, that means that they were never a part of the church. Mm-hmm. And in some instances, that is true. Uh, we see that people that, you know, they come to church and then they leave, but they were never saved to begin with. Mm-hmm. But here we, we would have to re, we would have to add that into the text. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say they had a false faith. It says yeah. they departed from the faith or they, they, uh, they entered and then exited. Yes. Yeah. Their faith was destroyed. So they had it and then they lost it to say that they never really had it. That would be adding something to the scripture, which we know we can't do that. Yeah. We just, we have to take the plain reading of the text. Of course, yeah. Um, okay, we're going to go to verse four. This is Matthew 23, 37. It says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather ch- your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. So this is Jesus talking. This is Jesus, yeah. This is Jesus talking to uh, to Jerusalem after he uh, he was speaking to the to the Pharisees and to the teachers of the law, and he laments over Jerusalem and he says, "I wish I could have gathered you." Right? It says, "I long to gather your children." Yeah. But I couldn't because you were not willing. Yeah. And and I think here you can also say, well, Jesus doesn't really mean that. Um, they they were not willing because God predestined them and they they were like robots and they were just fulfilling uh, God's desire. But Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say I, I would have I would have long I would have wished to gather you. But remember, you weren't chosen by God, so I couldn't. No, he didn't say that. He said I w- I long to gather you, but you were not willing. Yeah. And to say that Jesus is, doesn't mean what he's saying is Jesus acting here? Is he, is he, you know, pretending to, to lament over Israel, but in reality he knows that they couldn't choose him because they weren't, they didn't have that ability to choose God. Yeah. No, that's you're you're adding something to the scripture. Jesus laments because they could have chosen him, but they didn't, they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we see that Jesus wanted to gather them, but he could not because they would, would not accept him. Yeah. And this is like not the first time because oh, when, yeah. when mm-hmm. we look at the new, or sorry, not the new Testament, but the old Testament, we, we wanted to keep these verses in the new Testament, but there is a lot of instances, instances in the old Testament mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. 
Israel chooses God and then doesn't choose God and then chooses God. And it's like this, this kind of like cycle. Right. And, uh, and then we have uh, figures like Solomon who were, you know, uh, they spoke with God. You know, he received wisdom right, from right. God and then he fell um, into a sin. And it's like, yeah, you, you can choose God, but mm-hmm. then you can also mm-hmm. not choose God. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Let's, um, let's go into that, the fifth verse. This is Second Peter 2. 21 through or 20 through 21 it says if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our lord and savior jesus christ and again uh entangled in it are and are overcome they are worse off uh they are worse off at the end uh and oh and at the then, end than they were at the, at the beginning. beginning yeah and it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that it was passed on to them. So how would you so, explain this? I mean, it, it clearly states that they escape the corruption of the world, right? Mm-hmm. They, they know God as Lord and Savior. And then it says, it would have been better if they would not have known God mm-hmm. than to have known him and then turn their backs on him. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think the Bible can say it more clearly than that. Yeah. You can know God, but if you turn your back on God, you become an apostate who is now very difficult for you to uh, to know God mm-hmm. again uh, because you've turned your back on God. And it says, it would have been better if you didn't know God. Can you imagine? It would have been better to be an unbeliever than to have become a believer and then turn your back on Christ. Yeah. Uh, that's a pretty strong warning. I don't, I don't think the Bible can be more clear on that on that mm-hmm. subject than than that verse. It's yeah. I mean, you receive the the gospel basically, and then you under you understand it fully and you mm-hmm. accept it, and then you don't accept it. I think that's like for Calvinism. That's that's like a difficulty that they have to you know try to um, what's it called come through or explain because it's like you can accept the faith and then not accept it. Right. Right. So yeah. Uh, first six, second Peter three, 17 through 18, it says, therefore, dear friends, since you have been, uh, forewarned, forewarned, be on your guard that so that you may not be carried away by the error of the law, by the error of the lawlessness and fall from your sacred position, secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and savior, Jesus Christ to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Yeah. So it talks about falling from a secure position. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always, I always look at it as kind of like being on an airplane mm-hmm. and you can go on an airplane and you're secure on an airplane, but you know, there's some crazy people that decide to jump off the airplane <laughs> while it's 35,000 feet up in the air. Right, yeah. And, and you can choose to do that. That is your f- that is your free choice, yeah. right? You can be a Christian and it says here that you can fall because you're carried away by the error of the lawless. So you can go in the, 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 the way of lawlessness, you can choose sin and you can be carried away in that direction mm-hmm. and you can fall by losing your trust in God. You can fall from a secure position. You can decide to jump out of the airplane. That's not a very smart decision mm-hmm. and people are gonna try to stop you and, you know, the pilot is going to jump on you and try to stop you from doing that. Yeah. But if you really wanted to, you can do that. And that's your choice. You can fall from a secure position. Yeah. So I think that really flies in the face of Calvinistic teaching that says, once saved, forever saved. No, yeah. you can fall from a secure position. Yes, we are secure in God. I believe that 100%. We are, you know, if you believe in God, God will carry you through. God will, God will take you through. But if you decide to forsake him, then you can fall from a secure position. Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is the last verse. This is Second Peter 3, 9. And it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead, of, instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Mm-hmm. So this is going against that uh, the one of the one of the points that the atonement is limited, right? The th- the third point, uh, the the L, limited atonement. Um, God wants everybody to be saved, mm-hmm. and there's multiple verses that actually back that up. That's why this one this one is like the least uh, accepted by most people because 
the Bible clearly says, Jesus said, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? He loved the whole world that whosoever believes in God will not perish. So he loved the whole world, not just part of the world. Um, and he died for everyone. And, and it says that he is not willing that anyone perish, but everyone come to repentance. Mm-hmm. Um, because one of the teachings of Calvinism is, you know, if you're not chosen by God, sorry, you just, you yeah. didn't, you didn't get like, your name didn't get drawn out of the hat. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Um, and, and I don't think that God is, I don't, the Bible doesn't paint God in that picture that it's yeah. just, it's he, not a lottery. He, yeah. It's like a lottery. Like God randomly draws people. Oh, you're, you're in, you're out. Sorry. Yeah. Nothing you can do about it. Of course. Yeah. I think uh, like looking at these verses and kind of what we discussed, uh, with Calvinism, like what it means. And it, I, th- I look at it and I'm like, well, God wants you to come to repentance, mm-hmm. but you have to be willing and accepting and right, that right. means that you have that free will choice on your end to accept God instead of um, pushing God away, <clears throat> mm-hmm. as a lot of people have done. And we've seen that people have had faith, and mm-hmm. what the Bible describes is that the, that faith was genuine, you know? Yeah. But, um, and then they've fallen away, and then they didn't have a genuine faith after that. So for me, that, that kind of reassures myself that, like, I have, I have a choice myself to follow God every single day, not yes. just to, to count on this like uh, limited atonement for a select few people. Right, right. Um, I notice that even some Calvinists are like, you can't, you don't even have to evangelize because God's already elected his, his people. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's, that's like an excre- extreme that I've heard. And I think it's clear that Christ tells us to go uh, preach the gospel right, preach and, the make gospel. Dis- yep. and make disciples. And, that requires action. That requires free will on your yeah. part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I maybe maybe this doesn't apply to all Calvinists, but uh, I'm sure that the teaching, uh, the danger of it, can it can put you to spiritual sleep. Um, you know, it could put you to spiritual sleep where you might uh, not feel obligated to seek God, not yeah. feel obligated to pray, not feel obligated to pursue God. Because why pursue God? Everything's already figured out for you. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, are we are we are we running short on time? Yeah, we're running short on time. But oh man, just to, that was quick. Yeah. So, kind of like for the people to take away, it's like, uh-huh. uh, actually, what was it? We discussed this. Yes. Uh, I I think what's important for us to remember is that our choices matter. Yeah. You know, and and that's at the end of the day. Um, the, 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 the problem with Calvinism and, and the teaching of Calvinism is that it might lead you away from understanding, hey, your choices matter. Your words matter. Yeah. The Bible says that every word you say, there's consequences. Of course. Yeah. There's consequences for every thought you allow yourself to think. And, you know, every day we have to choose Christ. Yes, God did choose us. Yes, we are chosen before the foundation of the world. Amen yeah. to that. We are, we've been predestined. But at the same time, I have to wake up in the morning tomorrow and I have to choose Christ. I have to choose true, him yeah. as my free will choice. Yes, sir. All right. We're going to wrap this up. I think we're done. Come I think on. we're done. Thank you, Dennis, for coming on. It and was awesome. Please comment, like, and uh, subscribe. Maybe, maybe if there's a topic you want us to discuss, drop it in the comments. All right.